are live now. Emma and I are, oh, just a second, she says. So, all right. Welcome, College of Eastern Idaho. I believe we are now live. Emma and I were having just a little bit of um, technical issues. So, we are so delighted to welcome to uh, the Friday President's Forum, Wendy Seacrest, who is the Executive Director of the Idaho Workforce Development Council. And as you might guess, I am not the president. So President Amon is taking a hiatus today and letting me have the privilege of being able to interview um, Wendy about all things that are going on regarding launch. So Wendy, welcome to the forum. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. You might be one of the most busiest people, that the busiest people in Idaho right now with everything that you have going on with launch. So welcome. Thank you, Lori, and just thrilled to to be here and be back with uh, College of Eastern Idaho. Um, I have had the opportunity to do this once before, so happy to to be able to be with you virtually until we can be in person again. Great, yes, and President Amon did point out that he had the first interview with you, so um, I I am I am coming in second, but about a very big and important topic. So. Wendy, I wanted to give just a little bit of a bio on you before we launch into all of these questions. So um, this is Wendy Seacrest. She was appointed executive director of the Idaho Workforce Development Council in October of 2017 by then Idaho Governor uh, Butch Otter. She was formerly director of business outreach in the Idaho Skill Stack Program at the State Division of Career Technical Education. And as executive director, she's responsible for many different initiatives, not the least of which this huge new launch initiative, um, and also overseeing the Workforce Development Council members. And I've had the privilege of knowing Wendy since 2018 and have thoroughly enjoyed working with her on the council. So again, Wendy, welcome, welcome to the Friday President's Forum. And why don't we launch right into the questions? Sounds All right. Great. So could you just tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to serve um, as the executive director of the Workforce Development Council? Sure. Um, whenever I'm talking to a group of kids, I talk about myself as um, career planning gone awry. Um, so I actually have a bachelor's degree in radiation health physics, which is, you know, incredibly relevant to what I do today. But uh, I think what it shows is that, you know, where you start doesn't always determine where you're going to finish and, and, that, and that there's this permeability within um, within the world that uh, you can um, move in and out of careers and uh, take opportunities and, and kind of go with the flow sometimes. So um, I have had, uh, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about workforce development is because I've had the opportunity to really look at it from all of the different sides. Um, I worked at, after after I finished up my short uh, tenure as a health physicist. Um, I uh, went to work for an economic development corporation and um, worked in, as an economic development manager for um, two different organizations in Wisconsin, and then moved back to Idaho and work, went to work for the Department of Commerce, and ultimately was the Economic, Rural, and Community Development Administrator for the Idaho Department of Commerce. So. In the economic development world, you're you're seeing how you're helping businesses create jobs, right? So you're kind of seeing how that creation, you know, what it takes to um, build, you know, new facilities, expand, hire new people, all of that looks like. After I left the Department of Commerce, I went to work in higher ed. And so then I got to see what it looks like to help prepare people for the workforce. Right. Right. And then, because apparently I can't hold a job, um, I went to uh, the private sector for about four or five years, and I worked for Manpower um, Group US, so the one of the world's largest staffing organizations, right. and I ran their government division, and oh, part wow. of my job was to help our at the time, 800 offices across the U.S. to get contracts with government entities to provide temporary staffing services. But then the part of it that I was really passionate about was working with the public workforce system. How could we use the tools of the private sector to help better connect people? So when I look at it, I've helped to create jobs, I've helped prepare people for jobs, and then finally was able to be in a position where we were putting people into, into jobs. And so that experience, um, I think, it just it lets me look at the issue from multiple sides, multiple stakeholders. So, you know, I, I know, I, I feel 
for what higher ed goes through. I feel for what employers are are feeling, and I feel for you know the the government and and you know how we all coordinate and collaborate to uh, make really good things happen. Well, wow, that's an amazing background, Wendy. So, just as a curiosity, where did you do your health physics training? Um, uh, I graduated from Oregon State. So oh, okay. I actually started out as a nuclear engineering major, oh. but I was like, oh, I need to have something that's a little more people facing. And so I switched <laughs> to health physics. <laughs> You're definitely a people person. Yes. So, um, well, health physics can launch you into evidently you are an example into a variety of careers. Yep. And it's so exciting right now what we're doing um, with the Workforce Development Council because we have such low unemployment. So that makes it tough for employers. It makes it tough tough for higher education institutions. So I think that that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this launch program. Uh, so can, can you talk to me just a little bit about what is the council and how did it come about? How did it come into yeah. being? Sure, sure. So there's been um, a, a workforce development council um, in Idaho for decades. Um, it used to be an advisory body to the Idaho Department of Labor. And in early 2017, Governor Otter appointed a workforce development um, task force that was primarily made up of private sector um, members, but also included a, a really strong CTE presence. So former Dean of the College of Technology at ISU, Scott Rasmussen um, served on the um, task force and there was a high school CTE administrator and a workforce training um, uh, Angela's counterpart from North Idaho College was um, served on the, the task force. And this group um, was charged with taking a look at how we were doing workforce development in the state and um, suggesting improvements. And one of the things that they quickly realized as they started to meet was that workforce development is happening across multiple agencies, education providers, community-based organizations. We, um, we did a little project where we tried to quickly identify the dollars going into workforce development and um, identified eight different agencies at that time, wow. 24 different programs and over 60, um, $160 million that were all supporting different angles of workforce development, but they weren't being coordinated very well. And so the, the committee, um, the task force came up with nine recommendations and four of them were really kind of high level, like structural changes that we needed to make in Idaho. And five of them were pretty tactical, like we just got to get more money into the workforce to, um, training centers. We got to get more money into apprenticeship programs and, and some other things. So the that first one, the, the big high level one was somebody needs to own workforce development in Idaho. And it should probably be this workforce development council, but they're not in the right spot. They're attached to one agency out of the, you know, the eight that are, are actively engaged. And so they're, they didn't tell Governor Otter how to do it. They just said, you need to empower the workforce development council to, you know, develop a comprehensive statewide strategic workforce development plan and implement it. And so for a couple of months after the, the task force submitted its report, um, there were meetings going on between the governor's office and other stakeholders. And ultimately the governor issued an executive order um, that moved the council from the Department of Labor to the executive office of the governor for the first time, gave it its own staff um, and you know, kind of that autonomy to work across all of the partners. And specifically in, in our legislation, in our statute, it says that we are responsible for advising the governor, the legislature, wow. and relevant state agencies on workforce issues. So that that was uh, late 2017 when I was appointed and um, I had to, I had the pleasure of starting up a state agency from scratch, which I don't, um, I don't recommend to anybody. <laughs> Yes, but you have done an amazing job. I mean, it's grown so much since 2017. And obviously with launch, it's just um, skyrocketing into new realms for the Workforce Development Council. But the council has done so much work and so much coordination of that effort. And um, what I'm excited about is uh, seeing how the council and how launch is going to help marry work workforce development with credit programming. And I think that we are at that nexus where we can really make that happen with this new initiative. Uh, so the next question I have for you is, uh, who are the people that make up the council and how did they become members? Sure. Well, in case 
any of the people listening today don't know this, Lori Barber happens to be on the Workforce Development Council representing community colleges for the state. So um, it has what, been, a privilege, what a privilege that oh, is. What, a, what an honor on our side, <laughs> trust me. So, um, so the council is a 37 member council. They're appointed by the governor. We have specific membership categories that we have to stay within because we've got, we, we oversee a, a federal funding stream and we have certain rules around that. But um, the makeup of the council, we've got five elected officials. The um, superintendent of public instruction is on the council. So Debbie Critchfield, we're thrilled to have her mm. energy and excitement uh, coming into the council. We've got, um, Two legislators, so Senator um, Carrie Semmelroth, who is from Boise, and then Representative Lori McCann from Lewiston um, are the two um, uh, state level um, representatives. And then we have a mayor who, again, from your neck of the woods, Mayor Sean Coletti. We know and, a little bit about him. But you guys know a little about him. And then um, Commissioner Sherry Maupin from Valley County. Okay. Um, so we've got representation from elected officials. We have government agency heads. So Janie Revere from the Department of Labor, Tom Keeley from Commerce. We have um, one of the deputy directors, Jennifer Palagi from Health and Welfare, uh, Clay Long from CTE, uh, Linda Clark represents the state board, um, Jane Donnellan from Vocational Rehabilitation. I'm sure I'm missing um, one or two, but we've got these state right. agency. Then we've got um, a couple of members that represent um, what's called the workforce is, is the way that they're categorized. And so two of them have to be union members. So the president of the AFL-CIO sits on the council and um, another union um, representative. And then we have to have two that are representing registered apprenticeships. So we have another um, union joint apprenticeship training center director, which is James um, Smith from uh, Pocatello. And then um, uh, Marie Price from Idaho Forest Group represents registered apprenticeship on the employer side. Um, and then a couple of other community-based organizations. And then the biggest membership category is employers. And um, they've got to be nominated. They're nominated by um, an industry um, association um, to the governor. And then the governor you know, goes through and, and makes those appointments for, for all of the members. But it's a really broad group. and. Um, just brings wonderful perspective to all of the issues. Our our council meetings, Lori can tell you, they get feisty sometimes. People have opinions and that's exactly what we want. We want everyone getting their ideas and thoughts out on the table so that we can ultimately, you know, build the best programs, the best, um, implement the best projects for Idaho. Yeah, thank you so much for giving that history and, and how you become a member. And I will say that the meetings are just spectacular because there is that, I mean, they do get fe feisty, but they're always collegial mm -hmm. and so many opinions coming out, so many things that I haven't thought about that are really helpful for me to bring back to education and say, hey, here's what's going on in the workforce. So um, it's really an amazing council and we work so well together under your direction, Wendy. Um, so, uh, can you describe the first iteration of launch? Because I know there's there's a little bit of confusion because the Workforce Development Council has had a launch program, and now there's the new launch with the trailer bill. So, you can can you please just describe this first iteration of launch and how long it's been in place? Sure. So we started Idaho Launch in uh, November of 2020. Um, and, and, and that's pre-COVID or post-COVID, right? But pre-COVID, we had already been talking about the need to fill a gap for Idahoans who were seeking shorter term training that would help move them from, I mean, you know, let's be real. We don't have a lot of Idahoans that aren't working. You know, if you want to work, there's opportunities to work. But when somebody is in a low paying job and they don't have the funds to access the training and the training doesn't qualify for federal financial aid, that was really our niche. We were looking at what are those programs that don't qualify for federal financial aid, that there's no other resources for people to access that, that type of training. We wanted to fill the gap. And so one of the things that the Workforce Development Council oversees is the state's Workforce Development Training Fund. Every time an employer pays their unemployment insurance taxes, 3% of those um, taxes go into the Workforce Development Training Fund. And then that comes to us to be able to make grants and, and do make investments um, to 
help prepare people for the workforce. And so we've had in the past, you know, employer grant program, industry sector grant program, innovation grant program, which you guys are very familiar with, um, and an outreach um, project program. Well, we said, you know what, we need to do something else on, on top of, of those programs and address that, that gap where people don't qualify for federal financial aid. So when COVID hit, we had already started working, thinking about what this would look like. And then COVID hit and we had the opportunity to get um, to kind of kickstart the program with a million dollars of CARES Act funding. Wow. And that enabled us. So a couple things that we did with that, we had to build the launch website. We had to, we did a survey of employers and and at that time. So August, imagine August of 2020, you know, we're, we're definitely not out of the pandemic at all. but. Um, 845 Idaho employers responded to a survey to tell us what types of skills they needed in their workforce. And so we aligned the training that we approved for Idaho Launch with the skills that employers needed. And that became the first iteration of Launch. And we've continued to, to look at, you know, how are skills training uh, changing? We, right. we did a, a follow-up to that survey in May of 2022. So just a couple of, of months, well, <laughs> almost a year ago. Wow, how time, right. time flies. So 845 employers um, responded the first time. In May of 2022, we had 1,900 employers respond to it. It just showed what the need is. And what was really right. amazing about that was it was small employers responding. It wasn't oh. necessarily Idaho's big employers like, you know, well, we need this and we need that. It was small employers with 10 to 25 employees saying, you know, these are the types of skills we're, you know, not finding. And, and so we continue to adapt, launch, bring new training in, you know, identify what maybe we don't need to support anymore. And, and we were able to, um, put about 4 million of our workforce development training fund dollars into it until July 1 of 2022, where we started um, using ARPA funds for the program. And um, we have, we, this program has been so successful <laughs> that um, we are almost out of the ARPA funds for this wow. fiscal year. So um, we are going to have to make a couple of little changes for the remainder of the fiscal year. And then on July 1st, we'll be able to kind of start back up. But all told, we put about $15 million into Idaho Launch Training Idahoans. And, and that is training Idahoans who are staying here in Idaho yep. for those so, small businesses. Yep. And, and so that is the criteria is we decided not to put any income limits on it. We said if somebody wants to better their you know, skills, we, we need to support them. And so any Idahoan who plans to work in Idaho for a year following us paying for their training qualifies. And one of the most amazing things is we've been able to look at the people who entered the program in, you know, starting in November of 2020 and, and right. up until now. And we are seeing that their wage gains are fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 a year a year following training. So from when they start and launch, they are, I mean, the average, they're in poverty. They're right. $22,000, $23,000 a year. A year later, they're up at $38,000 a year. It is unbelievable the way that launch is changing people's lives. It's amazing. Yes, changing, I, I mean, absolutely just transforming lives. And, you know, here at CEI, we often talk about when you change one life, you change yeah. generations of lives because then that sets the, the next generation that's coming after up for more success. So yeah. um, it's not just changing one life, it's changing all of those lives that come after. Uh, so, and also at CEI, we talk so much about uh, degree certificates, of course, because we're in a, an education institution, but we also talk about skills and you know, we have yes. that work, we have our workforce training, um, we have our workforce training division and so what we really want to do is get somebody upskilled just to get a better job. And then if they want to come back um, for more training later on. And that's what's so great about launch is no matter where you're at in your trajectory or career, you can come back for more training to get an even better job. Well, and when you think about it, some people, they're just it, it, they're just overwhelmed by the thought of I'm, I can't do a yeah. college class. Well, yeah. If we can give them that small taste of success with launch, then it just opens up the door to you know, to, to help them have the confidence that they could finish an associate's program or they could finish a bachelor's program, right? It, it, it's, we need more of everything in Idaho yes. and making sure that people realize that we're going to, that 
that we're going to celebrate their success, whether they do a six month programming boot camp or a PhD program, that we need all of that. And, and that is success. We're not going to look down on somebody because they didn't get a bachelor's degree. They didn't do a graduate program. Absolutely. We talk all the time here at CEI about redefining what it, what success means when somebody walks through our doors. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that. So mm -hmm. now can you describe the new launch bill that was passed along with the trailer bill passed with it? What does that mean and how is that going to uh, be the next iteration of launch? Sure, sure. So in a minute, I'm going to go into some of the details of the bill, but like just generally, um, House Bill 24 was introduced right at the beginning of the session and um, it originally would have um, created the launch program and it was going to actually um, uh, um, transition the Opportunity Scholarship into launch over uh, a four year time period. So it would have opened the door for there being kind of one one pathway in for post-secondary support and funding. So House Bill 24 proposed $8,500 for any Idaho high school graduate starting with the class of 2024 that could be used at four-year institutions, two-year institutions, and other providers that the Workforce Development Council approved okay. um, so that we could bring in truck driving schools and right. other types of, of things that you know aren't typically done through our, our public institutions. Um, the House Bill 24 passed the House and then went over to the Senate and there were some concerns about uh, some of the, the language in launch and the Senate um, introduced a trailer bill to go along with that. And some of the tweaks to, that the trailer bill made were that it reduced the maximum amount of the award down to $8,000 or 80%, whichever is less, and, and we'll get into those details in a, a minute as to what it can pay for. Um, it it doesn't eliminate four year programs um, from launch, but it does target it more towards community colleges and then any other programs that the council approves that are aligned with in demand careers. So um, any program at a community college is automatically included under Idaho launch um, and it, uh, it it keeps the opportunity scholarship alive. And what they did do, though, is they went in um, in that trailer bill and they modified the language in the Opportunity Scholarship to make it only for four year degree programs. Okay. So community colleges won't have students coming under the Opportunity right. Scholarship any longer. They would be using launch, whereas the four year institutions will um, primarily have the, the Opportunity Scholarship. Um, available to them. So those are the the two bills. And I do want to, all of you, you know, in your in your part of the state, um, Senator Lent, Senator Cook, uh, Representative um, Wheeler, uh, Senator Burtonshaw, you had such amazing champions of Idaho launch. So don't hesitate to thank them. Oh, Representative Raybold, she's just amazing. Um, they all are, but please make sure you you thank them for all of the hard work that they did on yeah. getting launched through. We, we just have amazing legislators on this side of the house mm -hmm. and we would be uh, happier at, at how they support us. And they are just um, always there to, to help us whenever they can. So we are very grateful to their support of this for sure. Yeah. So can you, the, the magnitude of launch obviously is tremendous. So what all is the council doing to prepare to administer this initiative? Well, I, I decided to save you guys from looking at my uh, project plan graphic that uh, I've seen it, I think. Lori has seen it. Um, it's scary. <laughs> but exciting. It's a little overwhelming, but I mean, we're starting right now. So the council, the, the first two things that the council has to do is put um, two policies in place, one that describes in de demand careers and another that um, describes what the career pathway requirements will be right. for the seniors that will be applying for the program next fall. So those two, we've got different committees working on those. They'll go to the council on June 7th to be approved. And I've been, I, I, I've been putting pressure on council members, you know, every day saying, if those two policies aren't ready, aren't approved on June 7th, it, it really blows up our timeline. Those right. have to be approved on June 7th. Otherwise, everything else is, is going to um, suffer from that. The other thing that we're doing right now is we're starting um, the procurement for the grant management platform. So the existing version of launch, you know, 
we're serving, I, I mean, I think we're over, I know we're over 4,000 individuals, yeah. um, but, you know, we're looking at, at, and that's 4,000 individuals since November of 2020. So now we're looking at having probably 9,000 people a year going through the program. So we can't do the processing of the invoices on our own. And we've got to, um, we've got to acquire a, um, a technology platform that helps us administer the, the actual funding mechanism of getting the money out to the providers that uh, the students are taking, you know, their, their launch grants to. Um, so those are the really big things that are already underway, even though, you know, the money doesn't come to us until right. July. <laughs> we got to start working on them because right. July will be too late. Oh, the fourth thing that that is um, just a huge priority is preparing welcome kits for um, college and career advisors um, and making sure that those are ready to to go out and be in place in um, by mid-August so that when people come back to school, they're ready, they know what to expect. So that's where we're starting. So let me go. Let's. Um, Emma's going to put up some slides, yes. and I'm just going to walk you through a couple of the characteristics of launch, and you know, trying to answer some of the questions that we know are out there. So go ahead and uh, switch to the next slide. So as I mentioned, you know, House Bill 24 and Senate Bill 1167 work together to you know to be the the final statute that will go into place around launch. And so the total funding that we'll, we'll end up with, with the two of them working together, is um, about $75 million from the in-demand career fund and then about $2 million from a post-secondary scholarship fund that um, the, the board and state department had administered. We anticipate it's going to cost us 4 to $5 million a year to operate the program. We won't know for sure how much until we go through these procurement processes. Um, but if you recall, when the legislature did the special session in September of 2022, they actually put $80 million into the in-demand career fund. Five million of that was set aside um, on an ongoing basis to go to CTE to help support the added cost funding for high school programs, which is fantastic is. because we need, I mean, that's the pathway, right? We need Absolutely. Folks, yep, doing those high school CTE programs and then using that. So the 20 million that would have come from the Opportunity Scholarship is actually going to stay and will be used for four-year programs. So if we look at roughly $72 million a year available to us after we take out the you know, anticipated operating costs, we could be looking at about 9,000 awards per year. Wow. Uh, go, to the, go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, the options, the approved programs, any program that an Idaho community college offers is approved automatically under launch. So that's your academic and your transfer degree programs. It's all of your CTE certificates and, and associate degrees, and it's your workforce training. So no longer, right now, workforce training has to be approved um, with, you know, under the, the council and be, you know, it, it kind of goes through a special process, but anything that workforce training is offering will be automatically um, approved under launch. The other types of programs that we can approve, and, and this will be under, under the purview of the council. So, you know, we'll have, uh, we already have policies in place, but we're um, refining a process as to how we add the, the programs in. But it's programs that will be aligned to in-demand careers. So any four-year degree programs that are aligned to in-demand careers, like RN programs, BSN programs, um, cybersecurity programs, engineering programs, those will all be eligible for launch um, at our public institutions, but then also include BYU Idaho, College of Idaho, NNU and Western Governors. Um, Treasure Valley Community College, we would be able to approve programs that are provided on their Caldwell campus, okay. not on their Ontario campus, because it has to be an Idaho institution provider. But if they're providing it on Caldwell campus, we can do it. And then private providers like our CDL programs and our union training centers. Uh, go to the next slide. So, you know, our current state right now, in-demand careers is the big question. So how are you going to determine what the in-demand careers are? And is somebody is somebody sitting in a room somewhere deciding which career goes on that list? No, no. We use a data-driven process by which we look at in-demand careers. And so there is, and I assume that um, these slides will be available to you, but the, the link um, in that IDOL occupations in demand takes you out to a, um, a, a tableau table that the Department of Labor updates annually 
that um, lists all of the occupations in Idaho and it lets us filter them by different requirements so that the state board, CTE, Workforce Development Council, Department of Labor, we're all using the same data source and it's BLS data. It's, you know, that Idaho Department of Labor, you know, contributes to, to building out. So current state right now, the way that our policy committee, which Lori serves on, looks at it is we say, okay, if we're going to approve something under launch, we, you know, it needs to have training that requires more than a high school diploma, right? And then we generally look at it as do they have more than 150 job openings statewide and is there a positive growth rate? We met earlier this week and we were talking about, you know, if we just solely relied on that, what would be in, what would be out? Do we have some issues? And so we're going to be meeting again on May 23rd um, as a committee and we're going to throw one more factor into, into that equation. Um, which is wages. And so we're going to look at, you know, wages above $15 an hour, above $17.50, above $20 an hour. But what we're going to do is look at, you know, if they meet one or more of those criteria so that we make sure that regionally we aren't eliminating something that really is in demand regionally, but maybe doesn't hit all four or five of the criteria. Um, one of the one of the things that Hope Morrow brought up um, was that uh, nuclear um, operators show up. The Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't think that they need anything more than a high school diploma, which we know is inaccurate. Yeah. So, you know, in order to get them in, that's where we're looking at, you know, you've got to check one or two boxes. And so we'll be looking at that because what we don't want to do is have a, a process that involves one offs, right? Like, oh, we got to add this in. We got to add that in. How can we use the data to to drive the um, the in demand um, occupations list? So that plan um, May twenty third is a big day for the policy committee. They've got to make that um, finalize that recommendation so that we can get it to the council for the June seventh meeting. And well, go ahead. I'll just say that the multiple measures we we had a meeting earlier this week to to kind of start putting some sideboards on what this is going to look like. And I'm very excited about the multiple measures. So we're not leaving out, we're not leaving something behind, just like the nuclear operator or a welders, part, welders, or a part of the state where what we talked about logging, logging. logging industry mm -hmm. up north, that if we're just using one measure, we might miss some uh, miss an industry that really needs yep. um, workers and workers who would be willing to go in that into that occupation if they could get the training. So I'm very excited about yep. the multiple measures. Yep. All right, next slide. So now I'm just going to go through kind of a series of questions um, that people have been asking about launch. So this one's pretty self-explanatory. How far does $8,000 go and, you know, easily pays for a commercial driver's license program or related instruction for most of the trade apprenticeships? Um, your guys' tuition, you know, if I look at the um, average per year for Idaho community colleges, it would pay for a full associate's degree for tuition and fees. And then probably only one year of tuition and fees at a, a four-year institution. Right. Go on to the next slide. So it can be used for um, tuition and fees only. That was another change between House Bill 24 and the, the trailer bill is they were they removed the ability for launch to be used for room and board and um, certifications. And so it can only be used for tuition and fees up to 80% um, or 80% of the, the tuition and fees up to a maximum of $8,000. Next slide. How much is available each year? So um, if they are pursuing a, a associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, they can only use one half of the initial award amount per year. Um, programs that are less than 12 months, though, they can use the full amount in that year. Go to the next slide. Um, who's eligible? They have to be an Idaho resident. They have to have graduated from an Idaho accredited high school or its equivalent. And equivalent is going to include GEDs, um, private um, schools, and homeschool students. And so that's another policy that we've got to put into place as to, you know, if you've been homeschooled, what are we you know, what do we require in order to show that you graduated from an Idaho homeschool or an Idaho, you know, or the GEDs, you know, from when you get your GED, you know, what time period do you have to apply for Idaho launch? Because um, the, the, the fourth bullet there begins enrollment by the fall semester following graduation actually puts 
some constraint on us. Right. Um, you know, these individuals, they, they're going to have to have, you know, applied for um, or enrolled in an eligible institution as we're awarding these grants and then begin enrollment. Well, CDL programs and other workforce training programs don't run on a, a semester schedule like um, the majority of your, your academic and transfer programs right. do. So we're going to have to have some flexibility in there that allows, like for workforce training, you know, allows them to enroll a little, little bit later. And then they have to have completed a career pathway plan. Go to the next slide. Um, so one of the, the big questions is, well, are there going to be extensions? You know, individuals are going to go on missions. They're going to go into the military. They're going to do, you know, structured volunteer um, service. So, yes, we are going to have um, the ability for them to apply for an, extent, um, an extension if they have extenuating circumstances. And so, again, that's a policy we have to develop um, over the summer to um, identify, you know, again, what are you know, what will they need to show us to, you know, prove that they have these extenuating circumstances. And, and I know that there's been conversations about, well, shouldn't we let them have a gap year? The legislature was pretty clear that we should not. So that's, you know, it, it is going to be for specific um, um, circumstances that they would get approved for an, ex um, an extension. So next slide. What's going to be required for the career pathway plan? So that's something that we're working on that policy. Our outreach committee is, is working on it. Um, one of the things that, that um, we have been investing in for many years is Next Steps Idaho. And um, it's a college and career planning um, tool that um, the state board of education owns. And they have a, a student has the ability to create a portfolio in there. And so then as they do, um, interest inventories or um, cost of college estimators or a, a tool called Plan Smart, which lets them, you know, say, I want to have, I want to live in this kind of a house and have this kind of a car and this kind of a budget. What, you know, kind of money do I need to make? It lets them save their progress on all those tools. And so we're able to see that they've completed them. So that's our, that's kind of where we're headed with it is that they'll have certain activities that they'll have to have completed in next steps. Um, another alternative that we're looking at is we know that there are um, a number of districts around the state that do um, their senior project is college and career planning. Right. And so we would be able to say, OK, if your um, senior project requirements, you know, include these types of things, then we'll just, you know, your senior project can meet the, the criteria for that career pathway plan. Next slide. How are they going to apply for Idaho Launch? So we're working with the board. We want there to be one application for both Launch and the Opportunity Scholarship. We do not want people having to think, oh, I have to go here for this and there for that. And there's all these different requirements and, and so forth. So we're, we're going to be working to expand the um, Scholarship Idaho um, port portal. And that would likely be the entry point for both of the programs. Next slide. Can they get both launch and an all opportunity scholarship? Well, that's one of the things we're talking about. We've, um, you know, Matt Freeman at the state board is looking at opportunity scholarship rules. Um, there's really nothing in launch that would prevent them from, in the launch statute that would prevent them from also getting an opportunity scholarship. Our thinking is, is that they wouldn't get both consecutively. The, the thought is, is that they would get one or the other at the beginning. And then so if an individual, um, say, got a launch grant and came to CEI and did an academic transfer program, that then when they exhaust their launch funding, they'd be able to apply for opportunity scholarship and use that when they transfer to finish out their four year degree. So that's kind of the direction we're headed in. But more to come, you know, nothing to put in writing yet because we've got to go through uh and, and look at all the aspects of that. Well, and Wendy, if you think about all the money that's available to learners now in the state of Idaho, it's so exciting. So they have their early college dollars, the advanced opportunities dollars, they have launch, and then they have opportunity. That's a, that's a pathway for anybody who wants to go through and, you know, maybe they want to stop out an associate's degree or certificate, but the money is there if they want to go on and get a master's PhD, yep. a higher level um, degree. So it, it's just really exciting that all of this money is flowing right now in our state to improve the go on rate and to get 
employees in those good paying jobs that employers are begging for. Yeah. And I, I mean, honestly, I can't wait until we get to the point where we can start outlining what they can use yeah. their advanced opportunities for and then their launch for and just show them like, exactly. here's what you take in your sophomore right. year to get dual credits here, here and here. Yeah. And if you do all of this, then you use your launch and it takes you to here. We're going to, that is our vision. We're right. going to, to have those very clear pathways for students. We're revolutionizing how you get skills, how you get training, and how you get a really good job in the state of Idaho. And it is a great time to be in Idaho. Anyway, yeah. I will be quiet so you can go on. Yep. To yep. Okay, go to the next slide. So, um, and then I think this might be my last one. How do you, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to know what is going to be required of the class of 2024? They're the first ones that are going to be eligible for it. And as I said, we are, the reason we have to have these policies in place in June is because we've got to produce these welcome back packages that we promised the uh, school counselors and college and career advisors would be there for them. And, and what we'll do is we'll make sure we have um, extras of those to send out to the colleges and, um, you know, anyone who is working uh, out of school programs too, like the Boys and Girls Clubs and stuff, make sure that they all have that information. But, but it's very clear what a student needs to do in order to be eligible. We will be accepting applications starting in October. I mean, you think, oh, class of 2024, that's so far away. We have to start accepting applications in October because we have to make the first round of awards in December. So time is going to go very, very quickly. Um, that policy committee has its work cut out for it. the whole oh. committee, but the policy committee, and that, because that's what I'm involved with, we have a yep. lot of work to do. You do. Yes, you do. So I think that's my last slide, Emma. Yep. So just any, um, I don't know, Lori, do you have, you probably have a couple of follow up questions. I, do. I don't know if there's anything coming in in the chat or. So Emma will probably let us know if something comes in in the chat. And Emma, maybe you can take down the slides so yep. it can be just Wendy and I thank you so much. So Wendy, so I've talked about this just a little bit, but I want to return to it again. So um, something we talk about a lot here at CEI, and as I've already mentioned, and you and I have had long conversations about this as well, is how you marry credit and non-credit and how does that work to help somebody get that better job more quickly. Uh, so what, how do you see launch being a um, real catalyst to start marrying even more non-credit and credit learning? Yeah, and, and you use the right word there. It's a catalyst, right? I think it's it's providing the, it, I think it helps just reinforce that the opportunity, is, it, the, the time is right for us to rethink post-secondary education. Absolutely. And to, to just really think about the permeability of it and how we respect Yes. The learning that people do in many ways. So whether it was delivered by workforce training or whether it was delivered in an apprenticeship program or on the job, how do we respect that training? And then how do we help them build? Right. Because, yes. you know, me, Lori, you know, yes, you know, as a as a college, you guys, you know, if if you want to, you know, sit there and, and think that there is some sort of a um, conflict between workforce training and the four credit side, then you're not helping. You're not doing yourself any favors. If people feel comfortable coming into workforce training first and then they see that they have the ability, the capacity to to do it. I mean, would you rather have students or no students? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. That's easy, Wendy. I know what my directive is. Let's meet them where they are yes. and let's bring yes. them in and let's show yes. them they can be successful. And then let's create those articulation um, pathways that that just that respect that, you know, that that the learning can happen in multiple ways. That was just so beautifully said. And, um, you know, it, just, just any way a student wants to come into us, we want to we want to bring them in and get them the training that they need. And I talk a lot about here at CEI that the most forward thinking institutions, the ones that survive are doing just, the ones that will survive in the coming um, yep. decades are gonna be the ones that are talking about just this. 
How do we meet the student where they're at, get them training? Uh, and it looks like Emma has a question. So, so, okay, there is a question from, Roger is one of our communications and English faculty members. So uh, uh, yeah. I've also been very intricately involved in the um, Apprenticeship Idaho and the Youth Apprenticeship Initiative that we do. So of course, you know, Roger. Yes. Yeah. So there's his question. Okay. So the connection between launch and registered apprenticeship, we've already been paying for the related instruction for registered apprenticeship with Idaho launch um, from day one, whether it be the union programs or the, um, the community colleges or other um, related instruction. And so that's going to continue. That won't stop at all. We're going to support related instruction for apprenticeship programs. Fantastic. Yeah. Apprenticeship, all, all the ways that we can get all some ways. And as Roger knows, we're creating so many different registered apprenticeship pathways that go beyond just the traditional trades. Fantastic. But we'll always support, launch will support registered apprenticeship. Yeah. Thank you, Roger, for that question. So just a cut, we're running uh, right up against our time. So I just want to ask a couple more questions. I know launch is huge. It's taking up the majority of the bandwidth of the council right now. But what other initiatives are on the horizon for the council beyond launch? Beyond launch. Well, you know, um, last year we were um, very fortunate to receive some funding to help expand child care. Yes. Um, capacity in the state. And we received uh, $15 million to um, do the first round of grants um, to not stabilize or cover existing child care. Health and welfare does that, but to expand child care capacity. Um, so providers who want to add or employers like colleges who might want to start a daycare on their campus. Go figure. Maybe you might want to do that. that. Maybe align it with their early childhood education programs, like all these crazy things that could happen. Yeah. So we received another 15 million um, to, to do that. I will tell you the first um, round of applications, we received over $40 million in requests for that first $15 million. We could just wow. continue to fund applications that we already have, but we are going to have one more round open so that additional folks can apply um, for those dollars. So childcare has been a big one. The one I laugh, I, 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 I don't laugh about it. So another super, super important issue around workforce development is housing. And, you know, and I, I, I keep saying we need other entities to take on the housing issues. You know, I don't know what role we're gonna play in that, but, um, but housing costs are, are really, um, and then, really just launch is launch is going to do some amazing things for our youth when we look at what our go on rates have been traditionally right and and i'm not going to count the covid years you know but like pre covid you know in general almost half of our kids um, when they graduated from high school went on to some form of post secondary right and we talked a lot about, well, what, what are we doing, you know, to increase that go on rate? And we weren't necessarily thinking about, well, what are the kids who aren't going on doing right. and how are we helping them? And launch, I think, completely transforms that, right? Because now we're saying, again, we're going to meet you where you are. Yes. You know, if, if what you're interested in and, you know, the path that you want to take, I mean, think about this, Lori, if an individual at 18 years old, goes and gets their commercial truck driving license, right? They can only drive in the state of Idaho at, until they're 21, but that's okay because there's lots of truck driving jobs that keep them in the state of Idaho. They can drive truck. They're making sixty to $80,000 a year walking out with their CDL. So amazing. if we pay for that, yes. they're making sixty, eighty thousand 80000 a year. 80 to 100000 a year as they, you know, increase their skills and maybe, you know, take out of state, you know, types of, of routes and things like that. Those individuals, if they decide when they're 25, 27 years old that they want to be an engineer, they can afford to go back to school. They can do it. They it's can do it. Flipping that, that go on conversation yep. on its head in the best way yep. possible. And launch is really making that possible. The first iteration and now certainly the second iteration as well. Yep. And yep. again, it's just such an exciting time to be part mm -hmm. of uh, part of the part of the council and really living in Idaho. So it looks like um, 
quote from Roger, quote, the opportunities presented by launch are transformative. So that's again from Roger. And they really are. Thank you, Roger, uh, for listening and for sharing that. So we are past our time, but just final question, any parting words uh, for our campus um, as we conclude? Well, I would say you guys are, are truly um, an amazing group of individuals. Um, the energy that the College of Eastern Idaho has, the vision, you know, that you guys are, you know, you're not being bound by hundreds of years of we've always done it this way. And you, I, I love working with the College of Eastern Idaho because I know that you want to transform, that you want to, um, you know, th that you want to do the right things for your, your students and your businesses and your community. And so just, I appreciate everything that you guys are doing. And without you, the Workforce Development Council doesn't, there's nothing we can do on our own. It's you guys. It's all of the education infrastructure in the state and our community partners and the other agencies. We don't do these things ourselves. We just help provide the resources and the connections and, and the collaboration to make them happen. But you're the ones that actually do it. Well, Wendy, thank you for those kind words, but your direction and leadership on the Workforce Development Council have made this collaboration possible and to rethink and re-envision what education is, what it means. And so we are very appreciative of everything that you have done for College of Eastern Idaho. And I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, th this whole vision of this college um, is under the direction of President Amon. He's had a broad and grand vision of let's don't do it the way we it's always been done for a hundred years. So uh, Wendy, thank you so much. I know you are incredibly busy. Thank you so much for sharing some time with our campus and talking to us about all, all that's going on with launch. I think that answered a lot of questions for our campus. So again, thank you very much for your time. Anytime, thank you. Bye.